And we are ready for BIM here at CERN. Good morning, everyone. We are just above the CERN Control Center, the pulsating heart of CERN's accelerator complex, where physicists, engineers, technicians operate all our machines and uh, they make them, uh, with, they, they make, they put beams into them. So we are here today because we want to share with you live the injection of a proton beam into our veteran machine, the proton synchrotron, a machine that was uh, uh, the most powerful in the world in 1959 and is today at the heart of the accelerator complex of CERN, feeding into the LHC, but also many experiments. We are here today with uh, Frank Teke, who is uh, responsible for the PS commissioning. So uh, we are stealing you from your job today. Thank you for being with us. And it's quite a special injection today. Can you tell us why? Yes, Paula. Of course, we are eagerly waiting for the first injections which are at higher energy. During the last two years, the whole CERN accelerator complex, the injector for the LHC, has had a major revamp to, in, to inject at higher energies. Already the machine which we have before we inject into the PS receives the beam from the LINAC at a higher energy, but also then is accelerated further. So we extract now the beam at an energy of 2 GeV, while before this two year of uh, renovation, we were extracting the beam only at 1.4 GeV. And giga wh why is that? Why did you increase this energy? <laughs> so this is ultimately to increase the number of collisions in the LHC, because when we inject it at higher energies, we are able to make denser bunches of particles and then accelerate them further along the chain and finally collide these denser bunches in the LHC, which will produce ultimately a higher number of collisions. So a much higher number of interesting events for the physicists to analyze. And of course, because the physicists have already discovered the Higgs boson with the Large Hadron Collider in 2012. And to make this machine uh, more powerful with uh, more potential for discoveries, we are now increasing the luminosity, what we call, what is luminosity? You, you can tell us better. Luminosity is the proportionality factor between the collisions which we get for a certain event and the cross-section, so the probability that this event happens. So luminosity, the higher the luminosity, it means just we have more interesting collisions that happen. And so the physicists have much more data to find something more rare in this heap of data. Then. But of course, this is going to happen later um, in the year, the first injection in the LHC and then increasingly higher lumi luminous beams. Today is the really first injection after uh, two years of shutdown. As we said, the PS is also serving other experiments, among them uh, the antimatter factory. And we will later talk uh, to April Cridland, who is a physicist from the Alpha experiment. So we will go into the antimatter factory. You will be able to ask questions uh, to Frank, to April, but also to Klaus Hanke, who is the person in charge uh, of the PS operation and the upgrade of uh, the injectors. Uh, Klaus is sitting with our social media uh, team just behind the cameras and he will answer your questions that we cannot take here. We will take questions here, take questions on the chat. And uh, I also invite you to participate in our little quiz. There's a very mysterious object here. Uh, Frank, don't say what it is. <laughs> you know very well what it is. So guess what this is uh, and send your answers to uh, the chat in uh, any of the social medias you're following us with. And uh, the winner might, might receive uh, a certain t-shirt. So time to go into the heart of uh, the um, injection process. Uh, your colleagues down in the control room are, uh, are getting ready for this beam. What does it take and at which point are we, uh, because you've started this process of preparation for beam uh, quite a few days ago? Yes, we have been working the last month and last weeks even more on preparing everything, getting everything ready for this moment that we can inject finally beam. So we have to make sure that there is no one in the machine in the vicinity of the accelerator while we have beam going in there. So as you see right now, there is a video showing of a patrol where we check that there is no one in there. Afterwards, everything is hermetically closed and uh, there is a system that keeps track of people accessing and ex ex exiting the area. So we know exactly that there is no one when we uh, inject beam and we have to verify that all the safety systems for this work um, to make sure that we keep this condition. Then, of course, we're preparing everything that the power converters, the magnets, um, which produce the field to deflect the beam and to focus the beam and keep the beam inside the PS are working properly. We have to make sure that the radio frequency system, which we use for the acceleration of the beam, is working fine. So all this 
we have done and prepared. And so these uh, are images uh, from a few days ago. Right now, there's nobody ago, in exactly. the PS. <laughs> exactly, of course. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to send the beam. So we are sure of this. Um, but um, when we have all these condition prepared and uh, also have the green light from our radio protection colleagues, then we have finally the possibility to have the official go ahead, which we call the beam permit. So um, just, I mean, switch the traffic light from red to green to have the first beam injected into the PS. Okay, so you mentioned uh, a few previous uh, accelerators before the PS. Can we just review the, the path of the protons? Where do they start? Where do they come from? And where do they go? Maybe you can use that, um, that poster there. Yes, that is sure. a, um, a schematic representation of our accelerator complex. So the particles which we accelerate in the PS which you see here on this scheme, they start at a source for a LINAC and they start actually as negatively charged protons, uh, hydrogen, negative hydrogen ions, and they are accelerated in here. Then they will make, to lose the electrons, they get injected into the PS booster. And this is where we have beam already. So our colleagues there have been working hard to prepare everything to have the beam ready for today. And they are ready for some time now. Okay. So what we will do today is actually then transfer the beam from the booster to the PS and have it going around there. And then in the future, we will extract the beam to different experiments. There is a neutron time of flight experiment. There is the antiproton decelerator. And then ultimately, in something like six weeks, the beam should go to the SPS and then further on later to the LHC. And we are seeing now into an animation exactly this, this itinerary. Just I wanted to um, remark that uh, this uh, scheme is not in scale, of course, because the size of the LHC is too big to fit in a, in a poster like that. It's 27 kilometer. Um, how, how big is the PS? Of course. The PS is just 628 meter, which corresponds for the math uh, geeks uh, to 200 times pi. So, because the diameter is 100 meter, and then the circumference is 228 meter. And I'm told from your colleagues that um, you've now got the beam imminent warning. And this is a very exciting moment because it means we are very close uh, in minutes to inject the first proto beam into the PS. Absolutely. So this is what I was mentioning before, the go-ahead for um, the injection, so that we have checked everything, that everything is well prepared. This is what we call the beam permit. So a number of colleagues have to sign this so that all the work has been uh, finished, that the access system from the safety side, everything is, is running. And uh, so then at the end, it's our operation group leader who gives the final green light for the, the beam. Very good, and I think we can go now to uh, another of your colleagues, uh, Ron Zuckerberg, who is also uh, an amateur cameraman, so he accepted to stay with the PS operator. There he is. Ron, can you hear us? Yes, Paola, thank you very much. So I'm going now into the, the PS island, and I walk in front of the LINAC console, where the booster operator takes care of that as well. So we can see that the uh, the Linux is pulsing correctly, as we, if you understand the page. Okay, then we continue, and we see here some plots of the beam in the booster. So here we have the profile of the bunch, and I think it seems to be all okay. Yeah, yeah. So uh, booster is ready. Yeah, yeah, yeah. As soon as the PS is ready. Very good. Let's see. We go to the console uh, where the PS operator is sitting. He talks with the shift leader who is standing and a new operator who is learning. So, uh, what we can see here, here, we have the, on the right side, uh, the graph is the kicker pulse. So that's the kicker that kicks the particles in, in place. Uh, that's already pulsing. Uh, below we have the super cycle. So the operator has programmed uh, a cycle in there, and this cycle corresponds to uh, a beam. So when this cycle is played, then we get uh, we can have beam, but before that we have to go to the inhabit. But we do that later. 
this is the famous button. As soon as we take this button off, then uh, the inhibit is away, and then we are allowed to get particles from the booster. So I think we can go back to Paula, and then I will interrupt you as soon as uh, they're yes. ready here. Yes. Um, so it, you really do. Uh, you really push a button. Who well, have had a button? Of course, there has been, as I said before, months of preparation to get everything working already. So we test everything as soon as we can. That power converters they give the current we require, so that everything works. Everything is synchronized, and uh, so this is just a little step. But you don't see all the preparation beforehand that went into this. So I would really like to thank all my colleagues who did a tremendous work to get everything ready and the colleagues from the machines before Booster and the NAC4 to have the beam prepared so well that we are ready today to, after two years of having a sleeping beauty of the proton <laughs> accelerator, to wake, wake her up even though, of course, it was not sleeping in the sense that people were not doing anything. There was a lot of work ongoing for all the renovations, all the improvements, but uh, in the sense of beam. We didn't have beam for the last two years, but today we are again in the position to transfer the beam to the PS. And this finally you can do when everything is ready, in which we have made sure that then you can do it by the switch. So you, you didn't have beam in the last two years, but you were underground doing a lot of work on the machine. Uh, most of you, Ron mentioned uh, uh, the kicker is pulsing. I know you've been doing work on this crucial element, the kicker, but also on, the, on another magnet, the septum magnets. Uh, maybe while we're waiting uh, for the moment of truth, you can maybe explain about uh, these two uh, crucial elements uh, uh, that uh, provide the, the beam from the booster to the, to the proton synchrotron. We have yeah. also some images because we were filming uh, your teams underground while they were doing uh, these uh, upgrade works on, the, on these two uh, magnets. Ah, okay. There, um, is, there is beam alert right now? We've already seen it. Um, we've, already, we've already seen that video. Um, okay, so, uh, yes. Okay, so for, for the kicker and septa, these are crucial elements because the beam is extracted from the previous machine, so the proton synchrotron booster, and we have to bring it very close to the trajectory in our machine. And so there's a very thin magnet that separates the injection line where the beam is arriving from the circulating beam. So there's only a deflecting field to put the beam uh, in the right direction, almost at the, at the position of the orbit already. And then there is a kicker magnet a little bit further downstream that makes sure that this injected beam just gets a small deflection so that it goes on the closed orbit in the ring. What you see here is the installation of the septum magnet. So this is basically the last element before the, the ring. So this is making sure that the injected beam just gets on the right trajectory, on the right path. And uh, I'm told that we are ready for beam. Is that right? Okay. Okay, yes. Yeah. We are ready. Silence, we go back to the control room. Attention, no pas encore, on n'a pas... Oui, voilà, vas-y, vas-y. Ok. Ok. They're going to take away the inhaben button. C'est bon. Press. Cycle is coming now in a few minutes, four seconds. Sir. Nothing. Not yet. They're waiting for the for the beam. Should come in any moment now. Maybe there's still a problem on the other machines.
Okay, we, let's ask uh, what's going on. There's a, there's a problem on the booster, on the Linux, on the Linux or the booster. So we just learned from Ron, this is, this is live, and of course, <laughs> uh, we didn't expect this. There is apparently a problem with the booster, which is the stage just before uh, the proton synchrotron. Uh, can you explain us, uh, Frank, what's happening? Maybe you were saying that we can see something on that screen, right? Yes, uh, this is what we call the super cycle. So this is the sequence of different beams that are played always in a circular way, so repetitive. And when there is a white dot here, then this means there is beam in the booster. So we just got beam in the booster back, in fact. Oh, so, great. Fantastic. So now, ah, and you see it. Yes. So this is the screen which we have just next to the septum. So this is at our injection line into the ring. And we just seen that this beam now went into the PS. This is the beauty of life. So I was traveling <laughs> for a moment. We have been back in the booster. So uh, now they're ready to redo the injection procedure, I guess. Yes, of course. Now this is this is just the start. So we have to afterwards see that the beam gets properly uh, captured in the ring, that the energy is right. So there's many little things which we have to adjust. So this is just the very first step. This is a low intensity beam. So we have to as well increase the intensity. So this is just the beginning of our beam commissioning. But this is the first step we need. So from here on, we can take it in the next few weeks to prepare everything for the different experiments for the SPS. But how long and should we wait now until we see beam into the proton synchrotron from this stage on? <laughs> This is the, the, the just injected beam. Then, of course, okay, if you look in detail, you will not see very much what we have here now as screens. But the trace here, which is colorful, the, the pink and yellow trace, is the intensity of the beam which we measure. And the color code corresponds to different ranges. So pink is just basically the, the noise of a background and something which we have from uh, magnetic field changes. But then yellow is a little bit higher step in intensity. And we see here, this is the cycle, the magnetic cycle, we injected lower energy. And then we ultimately will accelerate the beam. But what we see here actually is this little yellow trace here. It seems to be that we have the beam in the PS there circulating. Oh. Really? Uh, when you go, can we go back to Ron? You can. Okay, I can show it here if you want. You see the screen? Yes. Yeah, okay. What you see here, um, from left to right, you see, you see a, a peak. That is the, the intensity when the beam is injected. And then when it is circulating, it continues until the end when we dump it. And uh, if there would be no circulating beam, then we would only see a peak and it will stop right away. So now we have a circulating beam in the PS. Do you confirm, Ron? Yes, as soon as we, now you see this shot? This yes. is the circulating beam. Great, congratulations everyone. We have a first beam in the proton synchrotron for the first Ooh. time in 2021. That's fantastic. So that's great. You already explained what's next. I think we can now go to the antimatter factory and talk to uh, one of the physicists who takes beam from the PS, who was very eagerly waiting for this moment. Uh, it's April Kridland with our reporter, Cynthia Rao. Thanks very much, Paola. So um, we are right now standing in the antimatter factory, in CERN's antimatter factory, and I'm joined by Dr. April Cridlin, who is a postdoc at Swansea University. And uh, April, can you tell us a bit about where we are and what is the significance of this place? Yeah, certainly. So where we are now is this is the antimatter factory building. And what happens when the, the protons leave the PS is where they're going faster, faster, faster. This is the only place on the complex where we're trying to go slower, 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 okay? So when the protons leave the PS, they hit a iridium target on their way into this building. And what happens is that gives off antiprotons. So everyone in this building wants to work with antiprotons. And this is the only place in the world where you can work with slow moving antiprotons, which is pretty cool. Right, and so you have a variety of experiments here in this, in this hall. 
Exactly. We have two decelerators this year, one new for this year, and then we have five big experiments here. So what we do is we share the antiprotons between us for a few different experiments. And why is antimatter interesting? Why do you want to study it? Yeah, so I'm sure everybody's familiar with the Big Bang Theory. And basically that tells us that at the beginning there should have been equal amounts of matter and antimatter created. But then when we look around us today, we're in a matter-dominated universe. Everything we see and touch is made of matter. So the question is, where did all that antimatter go? And it disappeared very quickly after the Big Bang. So it's quite a difficult thing to study. But that's the big question that everyone in this building is working on. So you work on one of these five experiments that you have over here, which is called Alpha. And as I understand it, you have two pieces of kit uh, that, you, that you use. So can you, tell, can you tell our viewers a bit about, about Alpha and what do you do with these two, two pieces of detectors that you have? Yeah, two sure. Experiments. So the first one we have is, is Alpha 2. that has been around for a little while now. We first started making and trapping anti-hydrogen back in 2010. So we've had the main Alpha machine for some time. And what we do with that machine is once we've made and trapped anti-hydrogen, we study it. We look to see if that anti-atom's fingerprint is the same as the matter fingerprint for hydrogen. And we know hydrogen so well. We know experiment and theory. We, we understand that atom very well. So what we're trying to do is understand the anti-hydrogen atom just as well so that we can pair it with the hydrogen atom. And we're looking for any small differences that might tell us how to tweak our theories to better understand the universe. So that's Alpha 2. And you have yes. a, new, a new piece of experiment, which is called Alpha G. And this is a bit special, so... We do. Um, so this is a colossal experiment, really, compared to Alpha 2. It's huge. So what we've done is we've taken the normal Alpha machine, we've turned it on its head, and then we've made it three meters long. So this is pretty big when you see it. Um, and what we're trying to do with this is we make anti-hydrogen in just the same way, but then we hold it and then drop it. And what we're interested in is which way does it go? Does, does it go down the same way as normal matter does? Because believe it or not, this has never actually been tested and it's really not so simple a question to answer. And then once we know where it goes, how fast does it go there? Does it go and fall at the same acceleration due to gravity as, as normal matter does. Again, we're looking for any small differences we can find. So just to give our viewers a quick recap, you have anti-protons produced when the protons hit a uranium target. And then you need to add anti-electrons to the mix. Yes. And you mix up your anti-protons and your anti-electrons and then you get anti-hydrogen. Exactly, yes. And I believe you have a piece of kit for us to show, uh, to show our viewers uh, some of how this is done. So exactly. let's take a look now. So. Inside all of our systems is a penning trap. And this is what a penning trap actually looks like. So if you want to trap charged particles using a penning trap, you need a static magnetic field. And it looks like a huge solenoid when you look at the pictures, or just a big cylinder. And then inside that massive cylinder, there's this little cylinder. And this is a stack of electrodes. And this is how we create our static electric field. So using both of those two fields, we can trap charged particles. So that helps us with trapping antiprotons and positrons, so then we can mix them together. But once we've mixed them, antihydrogen is neutral. So you can't no longer use just a penning trap anymore. So antihydrogen does still have a magnetic moment, so we can trap it holding uh, another set of magnetic fields. And that's how we trap it, we hold it, and we can manipulate it for the tests that we want to do. And when you say hold it, they're still moving at a certain velocity, right? They're still they are, whizzing yes. around. You're, so you're how not, slow not, is slow for you? So what we can do at the moment before we, we apply any kind of uh, cooling to anti-hydrogen or anything like this, that's not great. You can, uh, you can, we can hold them around 70 to 90 meters per second. 70 to 90 meters per second is slow for, for uh, antimatter at, at CERN. Exactly. So thanks very much for showing us this. And so we are now going to get the first beam uh, after a two year long shutdown into, into the PS and then subsequently into AD and Elena. But something's changed, right, for, for this, this whole, uh, uh, from this run onwards. So 
What is the first thing that you're going to have to do when you receive these, these antimatter beams, antiparticle beams? Yeah, so we have a new decelerator come online this year. It was tested shortly before the shutdown, but we haven't run any, any data with it. So job number one is to understand how this decelerator is going to work with these experiments. And, and because what this decelerator does is around the normal antiproton decelerator, we can, we can slow things down to about um, five mega electron volts, but coming into out of Elena, we can get it down to 100 kilo electron volts. So all of a sudden, these particles are moving much slower than they were last time. So we have to learn how to work with that. How do we trap these much slower particles? We have to change our timing. We have to change our experiment slightly. So once we've optimized actually trapping these, these, these anti slower antiprotons, then we'll start working with alpha-G. Because what we managed with alpha-G before the shutdown was to get it tested with antiprotons and positrons, but we didn't make any antihydrogen in that machine. So job number one is going to be making antihydrogen in that machine for the first time. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much for your time and all the best for, for the, the upcoming run of the, of the antiproton decelerator and Elena. All the best for your research. Thank you. Uh, don't forget, our experts are on hand to answer any of the questions that you may have for us. So please send them in and we will, we will have our experts. Back to you, Paula. And thank you, Achintia. Thank you, April. April is going to join us uh, in moments. The time to, to come from the Meran site uh, in Switzerland to this campus, Prevesan. We are in France, actually, and we are just above the CERN Control Center, where uh, a major feat has just happened. We got the first beam into the proton synchrotron, and it's now question time. Uh, I invite everyone to keep sending us questions for Frank, but also for April, and uh, also to send your uh, proposed answer to the quiz. Guess what this object is? At the same time, uh, send your address as well, because the winner will get a CERN t-shirt. I can confirm that now. So we have a question from Rami Al-Sabag. Uh, was the PS also upgraded as part of the high luminosity LHC? Yes, indeed. Yes, Paula, absolutely, of course. So the upgrade of the PS is concerning mainly everything related to this higher injection energy when we went from 1.4 giga electron volt to 2 giga electron volt. So all the transfer line to the PS was completely rebuilt then the injection elements, the magnets there, are revamped. So as well, then we need afterwards to have more intense beams as well, which we accelerate. And so this leads again to some new instabilities in the machine, which you have to fight against. So we need a stronger RF system as well to uh, fight some instabilities in, in, in there. And uh, so many things in the PS have been upgraded as well. And many things have been as well just renovated because of the age of the machine. Right. You said the machine is over 60 years old. So for example, we have 100 magnets in the machine, which are dipole magnets to make the the beam go around in a circle and also at the same time focusing this beam. And for example, we had in this long shutdown of two years, we had 42 of these 100 magnets, which are big they elements. were taken out. They are several tons. <laughs> they were taken out and the coils were renovated and they were put back in place. And so we have a, a, a renovated magnetic system there for yeah, the PS as well. Yeah, we can tell you work was going on round the clock uh, in, the, in the tunnels at CERN, not just the PS, but the, also the other machines. So Aslam Chakra asks on Facebook, what will be the ultimate energy of the LHC after this upgrade? <laughs> The LHC is designed to have a collision energy of two times seven TeV per beam. So in the center of mass, then 14 TeV. So, so far we have been running at lower energies to have a bit of safety margin for the cryogenics, but uh, certainly we will go in the next run to higher energies. So we, we've been to 13 tera electron volt already. And uh, the extra step is uh, one tera electron volt more, which is enormous compared to the PS. Can you maybe uh, summarize how the in energies are increased step by step at the various stages of CERN accelerator complex? Yes, Paula. I mean, as I was briefly explaining before, we have a whole chain of accelerators before the beam finally re arrives in the Large Hadron Collider. So um, the LINAC accelerates the beam to 160 MeV mega electron volt. The booster then goes to the 2 giga electron volt, which I mentioned before. The PS, then it depends a little bit on the purpose of the beam. For some uh, fixed target elements, uh, the beam energy is a little bit lower, 14 giga electron volt but for the LHC beam which then continues to the SPS we have an energy at the end of the acceleration in the PS of 26 GeV 
and the same for the AD target where we produce the antiprotons for the AD. So then it goes into the SBS at 26 GeV for the LHC beam and in there it's accelerated to 450 giga electron volt before it's finally injected into the LHC. At 13? At this, no, no, the injection is at 450 450 GV. and then it's in the LHC that it gets the, the bigger ac ex acceleration. Exactly. So in the PS is from 2 to 26. Yes. It's, a, it's, really, it's really incredible. And what always strikes me is that you can do this in a cycle of a few seconds. Yes. Essentially. Yes, we have a continuous, uh, what we call super cycle, repetition of different beams which we distribute to different fixed target experiments and the SPS with fixed target experiments and the LHC. And um, to fill the LHC is something of the order of half an hour in total. But um, in the meanwhile, in parallel, we're still producing other beams that go to the different fixed target experiments. And for example, also the booster produces beams that goes to Isolde, which is as well an experiment there with the beam from the booster. And we will come live uh, uh, in, in the course of this year at every important uh, increase of energy and stages. Uh, we'll do certainly a live uh, when the SPS gets beam for the first time, but also, of course, when the LHC gets beam uh, for the first time. We have another question from Facebook, Nasli Kimin. How long the whole process takes place? So we more or less just said, how long does the whole yes. cycle... Yes, this is the overall thing. If we just look at the PS, then it depends again on the beam. Um, but typically the acceleration from the injection energy to the highest energy takes just uh, of the order of a second, something like this. In one second? <laughs> even, even a bit less. Fantastic. Um, but uh, we have to accumulate the beam as well. So we get, in fact, for the LHC beam, typically we get two injections from the booster. So 1.2 seconds apart. And then this beam gets accelerated so that a whole cycle in the PS for this, for the LHC beam, takes 3.6 seconds. Fantastic. Amazing. And then when, when you have a, a, everything is running smoothly, let's say you are in a, in a normal run, um, how long does it take from the beginning, from the source, to get, to get everywhere, to, to give collisions to the LHC, to give uh, um, uh, experiments their fixed target beams and so on? For the fixed target beams, it's relatively quick because this is just a cycle um, from the LINAC booster, so this is 1.2 seconds and then another 1.2 seconds in the PS, for example, before beam goes to NTOF, for example. And uh, for the SPS there, you accumulate a bigger number of bunches before you start accelerating the beam. So there already we're talking of some minutes typically, and to fill, as I said, the whole LHC, it's of the order of half an hour. Great. I hope we have answered uh, his question. I think so. Uh, so, Bourdesea Iron from Facebook. Uh, it is pulse system for the charged protons in the ion source? Um, is it yes, a pulse the Linac, system in the ion source? The, the LINAC has an ion source to produce the negatively charged hydrogen atoms. And uh, yes, this is the pulse system. And this question leads me uh, to getting some of the answers to our quiz. Guess what this object that we have here is? Do we have answers, um, social media team? We don't have answers yet. You don't want certain t-shirts? <laughs> so maybe, they, maybe we can say something, something more, some, give some hints of this object. Uh, without revealing what it does and what it is. <laughs> yeah, this is something which, I mean, we had also during this long shutdown, we had a major upgrade from the LINAC and the previous LINAC is not used anymore. So this has been stopped completely. And now we started an accelerator already some time ago now which we call LINAC 4. Last year we were live also. Exactly, okay. <laughs> and uh, this is something that with this switch over of the LINAC became obsolete. And um, I just see April Kridland who just arrived from the antimatter factory. Thank you for, uh, for running to us. April, you just get your microphone and then come back because I'm sure we have questions about uh, um, antimatter and other experiments as well. Ah, yes, so we can give it this microphone. Okay, mm -hmm. April, please, <laughs> come on stage, straight from the car. <laughs> Welcome, uh, April. Thank you. So you, we just got beam into the PS for the first time. I guess this is something uh, you're celebrating, Alpha. <gasps> yes, we're really looking forward to getting started again. 
And uh, what is going to be the first? What is going to be the first thing you do when you when you get a beam to the experiment, which is not immediate? Uh, I understand. Yes, yeah, it has to go through Elena first, and and Elena get up and running. But the first thing we're looking forward to doing is uh, commissioning Alpha G, which is our brand new experiment. Uh, G stands for gravity, and that's a fantastic experiment because what are going to measure? <laughs> so what we want to do is we want to measure uh, how gravity affects antimatter. So we know when we drop normal matter, it falls at a certain acceleration. So we want to test the same thing for antimatter. Does it have exactly the, the same response? What do you expect? <laughs> Good question. <laughs> I, I hold judgment. <laughs> um, we ha there hasn't even been any test yet with antimatter being dropped in this way. So we have yet to see exactly will it go down or will it go up? No one knows. No one knows, and you would be the first to know. That's amazing. That's hopeful. And that's <laughs> thanks to beams from the PS. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, we have another question. That's for you from uh, LinkedIn, uh, from Yan Fei Chen. Thank you, thank you, Yan Fei. Uh, can antimatter let us travel back in time? Ah, uh, good question. Um, I, I guess this is uh, related to the Tent movie, which has been very popular. Right. <laughs> um, so. The trick with antimatter is what you can think sometimes is you can think of it as a particle moving forwards in time. If you reverse it as a particle moving backwards in time, it's like a mathematical trick. So uh, we won't be using antimatter anytime soon to, to travel back in time. It's a more a mathematical trick to, to think about it. But it, but it does encourage speculation about this. Of course, it encourages uh, movies like Tenon and, and things like this, which is always fun. So, uh, sorry to disappoint you, we don't do that at CERN, <laughs> but maybe in a few generations, uh, some <laughs> physicists will, will manage to do that. Uh, more questions uh, for our guests. I, I, yes, YouTube, Momita Chakraborty, what is expected to be observed, especially if any new particle? Um, is maybe at your experiment, you just said alpha G, you're testing gravity and checking whether uh, there is an anti-gravity correspondent, essentially. Exactly. Uh, are you expecting to find new particles? That's not exactly the job of, uh, no, of that's, Alpha. No, that's not our job. What we do is we make anti-hydrogen, um, and we're currently the only place in the world that's making anti-hydrogen. There are other experiments also within, within the AD complex itself trying to do the same thing. Um, but to go up to the next level and make the next biggest antiatom is, is quite a long way away for us. There are other experiments at CERN searching for new particles, especially experiments at our flagship uh, machine, the Large Hadron Collider. Exactly. The four of them are the best uh, uh, poised for finding new particles. Um, the, the, the puzzle today is whether they can find dark matter particles or supersymmetric particles. Uh, that's a mystery. We will see when the machine switches on uh, next year. More questions uh, from our social media. And uh, proposals for the guess what it is? Yes, from Facebook, Wizam Nuradin. How matter, as obviously, can study the antimatter? Ah. Oh, great question. That, that's a really interesting Fair question. Enough. Because everywhere you look around you, everything's made of matter, we're made of matter, everything you touch is made of matter. So, how do you work with antimatter at all? So what we do is we, we have a set of traps, which uh, we showed in the clip, we showed one. So we have um, an electric field and a magnetic field. And we use those two things together to hold on to antimatter and stop it touching any matter around it. Because obviously if it touched the matter, it would annihilate and there we've, we've lost our antimatter. That's, a, that's the big feat that you're going to test now with, uh, with Alpha G. You, you have a, a new trap ready. You were showing it in the in Yes. The clip, in so the, everything before. we've done so far is in the Alpha 2 machine, which is horizontal. So what we've basically done is we've taken the Alpha 2 machine, we turned it vertical and then stretched it. Um, so we've got a whole new trapping system to put inside there, which is going to be really long. And, and I want to underline how uh, CERN is the only place on the planet where we deal with anti-hydrogen. Yeah. Uh, we make experiments with it. We were the first to produce in the 90s, if I'm not wrong. And now millions of anti-hydrogen particles are produced when the machines are on uh, and studied to understand uh, this mysterious component of our universe. YouTube question stays lovely. Is CERN going to continue Higgs boson research? 
Of course, <laughs> of course, it's continuing because the LHC has accumulated so much data that there are uh, entire uh, papers and, uh, and theses uh, about the Higgs boson. The Higgs boson is a, a new particle. It's the only scalar particle that has been found so far. It's a very special one. So it's going to feed uh, a PhD thesis for a long time, I guess, even after the mas machine is, switch is switched off. I don't know, if, Frank, if you want to say. Yeah, of course, the LHC, the, the whole reason for this big upgrade, this big shutdown we had in the last two years is to increase the number of collisions in the LHC finally. So there is the program of the high luminosity LHC, where the injectors, they will produce brighter beams, they will produce more intense beams, or more denser beams, the brighter means intenser in our terminology of accelerator physicists. So, and with this, you get more collisions. And the ultimate goal is to have a total integrated luminosity of the LHC 10 times bigger than what we had so far. So there is still a potential for discovering many new things of the Higgs. And also to see there's some models that predict, for example, it's not a single Higgs, but it could be two different Higgs particles that are just very similar. And in order to see eventually if it's this, then of course, uh, the experiments continue yeah. to do all the analysis of the particles which we provide. Spotting one is, uh, is not the end of the story, I can tell you. So another question from YouTube, Stako Okat, thank you for your question. What do you do to the anti-hydrogens once you make them? Yeah, so basically what we do is normally we run over an eight hour shift. So we can make about a thousand anti-hydrogen atoms over that time. And then once we've kept all of those together, we shine lasers on them because we want to know if they react in the same way as hydrogen does to the okay. same lasers. And, and basically what that allows you to do is, is measure the fingerprint of that atom. So every atom has a particular fingerprint that you can, you can measure. And that's what we do with anti-hydrogen. We compare that then with hydrogen. What are the hints so far? Because you've done this uh, before, a shining laser on anti-hydrogen. And I, I know that Alpha has published uh, a lot of, of new uh, research papers recently. What, what have you found that is intriguing that leads you to make more experiments? <laughs> so what we found at the moment, we've only measured um, one transition to a very high uh, precision, so 10 to the minus 12 precision. We've measured uh, the ground state to the first excited state. Um, but hydrogen itself is measured to 10 to the minus 15 precision. So we're still three orders of magnitude away from what they can do with hydrogen. Okay. So we've got to keep pushing uh, until we can make a direct comparison. That, that's how research progresses and how science exactly. progresses. So from LinkedIn, uh, Josue Vitalione, thank you. Could antimatter enable new energy storage compact solutions in the future? That would be lovely, wouldn't it? Could we, <laughs> could we solve the energy crisis that we have with this? Yeah. Um, so basically, the issue at the minute, of course, is being the only place that makes this stuff, is that it's really expensive <laughs> to make this. <laughs> so if you could uh, make that process more efficient, uh, then in the future, possibly, we could, we could think about that. But we cannot answer this question uh, un until we've studied it in depth. So this, we are at a very far away stage from the future application on the energy problem. So we need to, to study more and, uh, and get more fundamental knowledge before we can apply this knowledge. Another question. Noel Rockel from Facebook. Can you get an anti-Higgs boson? <laughs> oh, I think you're asking the wrong person there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, you want to ask a, a theorist that question. We will ask a theorist uh, <laughs> and we will let you know uh, very soon on the chat. Uh, this is not a question for today, but thank you for the question. Uh, you cannot. Uh, we hear from the, from the audience, uh, from our, from our technical, uh, technical crew, which includes an uh, ex-Higgs boson physicist. Uh, you cannot get an anti-Higgs. It's the same. It's the same particle. Uh, the Higgs is the same particle and its own antiparticle. This is the only thing I can say for now, but I invite uh, uh, Piotr to write the answer complete into the chat. Thank you. And I think uh, uh, with this question, we might as well close uh, um, the show today. I would like to thank, first and foremost, uh, the CERN Control Center, Frank and uh, uh, Klaus Hanke, uh, and the whole team at the PS Controls for letting us in, uh, disturb <laughs> their work and uh, to share this moment with you. And I would like to thank April, of course, uh, for taking you away from your antimatter factory and coming here on the Prevescent site in France for answering the questions. Uh, thanks to the um, 
to the viewers, of course, for your questions and for everybody who has watched us and thanks to the technical crew. We'll certainly come back live um, uh, when our next accelerator in the chain gets beamed for the first time, the super proton synchrotron. And for now, bye bye. And um, ah, there's another question. It seems like in the video clip you showed a piece of the thing that you asked us to guess. So is it an injector of hydrogen protons? So this is, thank you for uh, answering the quiz. Uh, Frank, uh, you are the judge uh, to ACOP. <laughs> is this an injector of hydrogen protons? Uh, this, it's not far from the from the truth, yes, right? Yes, yes. As I said before, this is the part which is now obsolete because the hydrogen. I mean, the the hydrogen which are negatively charged, which we produce now in ANAC four, they're a bit different. But we're we're. I mean, it it has to do with the source of protons. It yes. is a proton source, and I really congratulate Akop for uh, guessing the answer in his own terminology. But he was not wrong. So yeah. this is a proton source. It's at the very beginning of the accelerator complex circuit, and it makes uh, the the protons for injecting into the into the first stage, which is the linear accelerator, the LINAC. So congratulations. Uh, this was uh, full of emotions. <laughs> we lost the beam. We got the beam back. We got the beam into the PS. We got April safely. And we got the answer to the quiz. Thanks, everyone. And uh, see you uh, at our next live. Bye for now.